welcome to the Envision Rise podcast show, a podcast that helps foster respect through inclusion, service, and equity. Now here's your host, Stacey Hegarty. Welcome to the Envision Rise podcast. I'm Stacey Hegarty, your host and Vice President of Equity and Inclusion for Envision Rise. Our guest today is Sheldon Spotted Elk, judge for the Ute Indian Tribal Court of Appeals. Welcome, Sheldon. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much, Stacey. It's good to join you. Well, we are excited to have you. I've had the opportunity to get to know you a little bit elsewhere. Tell our listeners about yourself. Tell us a little about your background, anything you'd like to share. First and foremost, the coolest thing about me is I have two sons uh, and so, and our kids go to school together. And so here in Denver, but so I, I'm a dad, I'm a native father. And so I get, my sons are teenagers. And so that's the coolest part about who I am. Professionally, I'm a lawyer by training. And so at one time I represented kids and maybe I'll talk a little bit more about this in the interview, but I represented kids in juvenile delinquency issues and child dependency issues. And so when children are in foster care, so I did some of that work. I worked for a tribe and now currently I work for a national foundation and I do a lot of work around systems and um, the Indian Child Welfare Act, which is a federal law that applies in state courts. And so I do a lot of work connected to that. And then of course I'm a judge for an Indian tribe based out of Utah, but I myself, I'm Northern Cheyenne from Lame Deer, Montana originally, but grew up most of my life near the Navajo and Ute reservations in the Four Corners area. So that's kind of who I am and what I do. And now you're here in Denver. We're glad to have you here. So many people don't really have a personal connection or even much real knowledge about Native American communities and the caricatures and the stereotypes are still very common misconceptions. And you know, in some cases, children are learning these misconceptions in school and they're not getting accurate history. So they're not really understanding present day issues that are coming up for a lot of the tribes. And I'm not asking you to speak for every single native person or every tribe, but you've got a really interesting insight to the world of what's going on in justice for Native Americans. Can you share with us a little bit some things you wish people understood the indigenous people are facing now? Yeah, I appreciate you saying that. I don't have to speak for all Native people because I, I think sometimes there, there is an outside perspective that American Indians were a monolith, you know, and, and oftentimes, like you're pointing out, the education system teaches about American Indians like we're dinosaurs. I think they teach the dinosaurs in one month and then next week it's American Indians. <laughs> you know, it's usually around Thanksgiving. So there's like a very specific narrative that fits within the colonial narrative of America, of the colonization of America. And so, so definitely I feel like our education system in a lot of ways is to blame for the general public of not really knowing too much about what's going on. And if they do know, sometimes it's this antiquated kind of idea of or a Hollywood kind of idea of who American Indians are. And I think that's intentional. I feel like that's intentional of our school system, of America, of colonization, to have this outlook of American Indians in an erasure kind of sense. And so to make us invisible, unfortunately. We are a small part, percentage of the population, overall population, we're only 1% of the population, you know, almost 2% of the population, I think, at this last census. And so we're not very populated in that sense, but we're all over the country in a lot of cities. There's 574 tribes, federally recognized tribes in the country. And so, and a lot of us live in cities. So where I live right now in Denver, I live in the city. And so a lot of American Indians live in cities as well. But culturally, there's so much diversity when it comes to the American Indian experience. I'm fortunate in the sense that I grew up culturally connected. My father's first language is Cheyenne. Um, I grew up just squarely in that frame of being a Cheyenne man, you know, Hetan, you know, being a Cheyenne man, like was raised that way. But obviously, and then also I grew up, my mother is white. And so I kind of grew up in these, like that idea of a code switch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> rules. One foot in and one foot out almost. Yeah. And the rules that when I'm hanging around my Northern Cheyenne family are way different than when I'm hanging around my white family that lives in Lily White, Utah, you know? And so there's a, a big, difference culturally of how things happen in the house and how people talk to one another. And, and so there's a big chasm there culturally. What was that like growing up? That had to be really challenging to have such different cultural norms on each side of the family. 
yeah, it was just growing up for me. <laughs> so like, I didn't really think about it until I became an adult. And so, and in some ways there was some benefits to it because of course you interact with diverse communities all the time, or a lot of us sometimes, sometimes I know people out there don't interact with diverse communities at all, mm -hmm. uh, but I think it kind of brought an awareness of, of a humility, you know, a cultural humility that there's different ways of doing things and not even a value connected to it. There's not a right or wrong or good or bad. There's just different ways of doing things. So I think one of the good things about growing up like that, I, I think I had I, empathy and compassion for, oh, there's a lot of ways of getting here, you know, a lot of ways of doing this. So that's one of the benefits. But the other drawback, I think, is it's sometimes tough because you kind of occupy this in-between place that I think I only feel like my siblings really understand what that is like. I've yet to meet somebody, especially all the cultural dynamics. I come from really two strong cultures, actually. And so growing up in those competing cultures, and sometimes there's debates between my parents and all that. As a child, I'd watch that and see the table tennis match of that going on about <laughs> cultural values, you know, and so it could be isolating as well. So. So when non-natives are thinking of what it must be like to be a Native American in current times, I think two things come stereotypically to people's minds. There's either the tribes that have casinos or the very, very poor tribes that are struggling with a lot of social issues such as addiction and domestic violence, things like that. My guess is that is... Those are two extremes. And if you could talk a little bit about that, that obviously not every tribe has the same shared experience. What would you like for people to understand that is between those two extremes? <laughs> I think seeing our humanity, I think sometimes that's, and of course, none of us like to be objectified in any way. And so if we were only seen as one dimensional, you know, like I, I think that would take away all of our humanity, you know, and so whether that's based on your gender or your race or any of those things. And so I think seeing our full humanity as indigenous people and for Cheyennes, that's very specific. You know, our ceremonies, we're a Sundance tribe. And so part of our Sundance, it's we're renewing our relationship actually, and we're renewing our humanity, if you will, actually. And how we do that is our connection to the earth and our connection to others. And so other Cheyennes. And so that's something that we realize we're, Part of being a human being is sometimes you could make mistakes and sometimes you could be not the best, you're not your very best. <laughs> so we recognize that as Cheyenne people. And so part of that is the practice, the ceremonial practice of trying to be a better human being, you know? And so that's so important to our culture that we renew that relationship every year through that Sundance. But other, another thing that might be unique culturally to Northern Cheyennes is that we do have two sacred, I think sometimes they're called, referred to as covenants, but we have a sacred hat that is kept up at the Northern Cheyenne resident in Lane Deer, Montana. Somebody's praying over that this morning, actually, and they're praying for all humanity. And then we have sacred arrows, and those are kept in Southern Cheyenne with the Oklahoma tribe, down in Oklahoma. And so those two objects, sacred objects, represent a feminine and a masculine energy. And so we also recognize that we have life-giving powers, you know, so when those two medicines come together, the highest medicine that we have as human beings of being able to create life is manifest. And so this is all like, it's not in the past. This is something that happens even today, you know, so like these are all, of course, I don't think if you talk to, if you went to Lame Deer, Montana, you're like, hey, I want to see the sacred hat. You're not going <laughs> to, they're not going to give it to you because of course the history of colonization and forced assimilation there was a period of time where our religious practices were outlawed and that had devastating impacts to our community, devastating impacts to my family. And so a lot of my family went underground actually to practice their religion. You know, there's some history like letters from the superintendent of the Northern Cheyenne reservation to Washington DC. And they're talking about like, pretty please let us do the Sundance this year. We'll take out whatever you want, whatever you feel offensive about the ceremony, we'll take it out. It was so important to us that they're willing to try to navigate racism and colonization in order to make sure that happened on a yearly basis. And it's just kind of devastating to really think about that as 
as when we live in a country that purports that there's freedom for all and there's equal protections under the law. There's a free exercise of religion, you know, that this is something that my father, like somebody who's living right now, had to have their lifetime, so. So you're a lawyer and, you know, you just, you know, we're talking now about how we live in a nation that says equal protection under the law, those kinds of things. But there are very specific, there are a lot of things that impact Native Americans that simply don't impact other identities within the U.S. And you also mentioned that you've worked with children and you know, navigating the juvenile justice system for children. So what are some of the things that we don't know, that those of us that aren't living it don't really understand and don't know about what's going on for Native Americans at this time? Yeah, this is a big topic. <laughs> I could go on for a long time. Um, I do want to add just to that previous question too. I think part of what I think the world, not only to see in our humanity, but I think we see fully, and this parlays into the question that I'm going to answer now with the law, but art, I think art is a good pathway. So if you're listening to this and you're like, man, I don't even know American Indians at all. You know, where do I go meet American Indians? <laughs> you know, like, how do I get a buddy? You know, like, uh, that may not be accessible to you. But I think looking at literature, looking at art, I think those are good ways to be able to make connection and see humanity in communities that you might not have access to immediately at the like next door neighbor kind of stuff, you know, so. But the legal history in America, when it comes to American Indians, there's a whole body of law called federal Indian law. Um, and mind you, it's not like all the indigenous legal scholars got together and said, hey, let's create a body of law. This is colonial law that was in, imposed upon American Indians. And there's a lot of racist foundations in that law that failed to see our humanity first and foremost. Actually, if you ever, those that went to law school, maybe the first property case that you ever read in your property law class is this case called Johnson v. McIntosh. And it's from 1823. So it's an old case. And it really kind of destroys your idea about what property's about, you know, like how you acquire property. But it's a case between two white people that are debating on who has better title to the property. So they're fighting over some property. There's some history on this that they say that this case was just made up so it could be at the Supreme Court. But out of that, the dispute was made up so they could get to the Supreme Court to really have this law out there, the doctrine of discovery. And it's this racist idea that a conquering nation could come in and not see the humanity of the people that occupy the land. And so we also have these discovery tropes, you know, that, hey, Christopher Columbus discovered America when there's these people living here, you know, so, and how that intersects with the law. And so the, the doctrine of discovery is about how this whole landmass of America was stolen from American Indians. And so it failed to recognize our connection to this earth and gave time to the conquering nation that then bestows it upon white men, actually, at the time. So nobody could own property except white men. And so, and so that's who this debate is about. But I think that what ends up happening in out of this, there's a couple of foundational principles out of federal Indian law. And one is tribal sovereignty. And so that tribes, well, I mentioned that earlier, there's 574 tribes. Each of them are sovereign nations. So each of them have the ability to make laws, enforce those laws, have courts adjudicate those laws. And so, and so sometimes that's an invisible system to a lot of people in America. And so that kind of makes a different relationship when it comes to like maybe interpreting the equal protections clause of the constitution and how it lands with american indians because we are a race and so yeah we're part of the race but we're also a sovereign nation as well and so there is kind of a different analysis legal analysis when it comes to that however i feel sometimes and i'll add this just as a caveat and i think sometimes that when it comes to other issues that affect a lot of other people of color Police shootings impacts our community as well. It's important for American Indians to build allyship with the black community around that issue as well. Children, families being dismantled by the child welfare system happens at high disproportionate rates with black families as well. There's, I think we should create allyship and a lot of those concerns are concerns, you know? And so I think sometimes saying, oh, it's a tribal sovereignty issue, kind of sidesteps the bigger issue of race that's happening in America right now. 
But I find it interesting. It's like some of these issues that we or our tribal communities have been dealing with for a long time. And I'll give you the example of the mascot. So I talked to you earlier about more objectifying. Nobody likes being objectified, you know. And so mascots do that to American Indians. So Washington football team, the commanders now, they used to be called something else, a racial slur. We've been trying to change that aggressively for a long time in the courts since the early 1990s. And it took the American public witnessing the murder of George Floyd for that to topple. And so that's how connected our issues are. And so I think it's really important for us not to live sometimes in a silo of the tribal sovereignty silo, but also in the relational world with other communities of color that are facing issues that really impact us in a significant way. So, you, You've used the term allyship a couple of times in this conversation. I think this is such an important piece of it. When you and I spoke before, you talked a little bit about allyship failure. And if you can share with our listeners a bit about what does that mean and what can we do? I can't remember exactly why we brought that up before. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I think it was in, in terms of you know, exactly what you were talking about, that so many different populations that are minoritized, underrepresented, people of color, oftentimes those populations are trying to stand on their own. And when you're looking at small numbers, such as less than 2% of the population is Native American, about 13% of the population identifies as African American or Black. Individually, those are smaller numbers. But when you start, why are those groups not doing a, and maybe they are, having some more proactive work towards allyship together since these groups are facing so many of the same issues? Yeah, I do a lot of training and so like training for judges and lawyers. And I usually have this quote that I'll share and I can't quote the whole thing off you, but the essence of that quote is about, it's a native woman talking about trying to create change. And it's a unique position sometimes for American Indians that are out there trying to create change because naturally the system hasn't been made for us. And so when we're voicing how this system doesn't meet our needs, oftentimes we're kind of looked at as the problem is what she's saying. And so sometimes we're seen as like, oh, the problem is actually Sheldon. He's always complaining about something where like I'm complaining about something for good reason because it's not meeting my needs and my community's needs. And so I think empathy is a, an important aspect of this. I think sometimes where allyship failure happens is I think it's sometimes performative. I've been at many meetings where I could feel it when I walk in the room. I'm like, oh, why was I invited to this meeting? You know, I'm on this task force now and I walk into the room and I look around the room and I see, oh, I'm just the checkbox American Indian in this room, you know? And so they say, oh yeah, we have Sheldon's here, you know, Indian, mm -hmm. check, we, we did it, you know? So I think sometimes it's performative. It's not deep enough sometimes. Uh, part of the human experience, especially building out allyship, I think it needs to come out of love. And so it needs to come out of, willingness to love humanity, first and foremost, but also a willingness to empathize and learn and have compassion for other people's experience, you know, like in this conversation that we're having, you know, like me being willing to listen to you and you being willing to listen to me, you know, and, and proceeding with it. curiosity, intellectual curiosity, and also the type of curiosity that the love for humanity kind of facilitates as well, you know, so I think those are some really key aspects of if you're looking to build sincere allyship into community, Brian Stevenson, I'll add this in there. Brian Stevenson, one of my heroes, great lawyer, gave an amazing TED Talks, written awesome books. But he talks about the need for proximity, and I think that's part of it as well, is that we, in order to be an ally, we need to be proximate to those communities and we want to listen first. And I think you brought up such a good point earlier about how we've been doing several episodes lately about art and how it opens doors to compassion and empathy and better understanding of a lived experience that isn't necessarily our own. And it's so hard to hate someone that you understand a little bit. It's so hard to make sweeping judgments about entire groups of people when you've seen just a little bit of what their experience is. And that doesn't mean 
rush out and go find yourself a Native American friend if that's <laughs> if that's not naturally in your life. Don't rush out and do that. That's awkward. <laughs> but there are plenty of books to read. But you know, I'm thinking probably Hollywood's not doing a really great job of portraying a an accurate Native American experience, considering one of the most popular movies during its time was Dances with Wolves. The, the main character was a white man. Is there a favorite book that you would recommend someone look at or a movie that, that you think would help somebody better understand a little bit? And then we're going to talk about the foundation. Yeah, I think my favorite book that I've read recently is a book called The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee. I think I have it somewhere just right here close by. <laughs> so if you're looking at, like, I want to read a book and understand the American Indian experience in a historical and in a contemporary context, that book does a really good job. Uh, talking about just the layers upon layers of why we're at where we're at right now. And so there is, the book kind of highlights there, and I meant to bring this up a little bit earlier, but just there was intentionality about dismantling our culture and our values and our connections, you know? And so there's a historical trauma dynamic that happens within a lot of American Indian communities that we're still healing from. That there still needs to be truth being told about that in order for us to start thinking about reconciliation, you know, and so that truth hasn't really ever been put out there. And so in that book, he speaks the truth in some bold ways. So I, I like that book a lot. As far as a movie goes, I recommend this documentary and it's kind of connected to what you were talking about earlier, just about the Hollywood tropes of American Indians and how deep that is. And I think oftentimes if you just meet somebody on the street and they don't know anything about American Indians there, I think where they got that information is from TV, you know, so that's the only access they have. And so maybe it's old John Wayne movies, you know, and so they have these ideas of what, racist ideas of what American Indian experiences look like. And so the movie's called Real, like the real, like R-E-L engine. And so I <laughs> really kind of understand it's done by a native and he goes to Hollywood to try to figure out where all these tropes come from and what that means. I think this is interesting and ironic. I had a friend that was in the Geronimo movie that was by Wes Studi that mm -hmm. was in the 1990s, or the 90s. But it was so much that my native friend that was extra in that movie, they wanted them to put extra dark paint on their faces. <laughs> and so they had to do skin like they had to put darkening on their faces because they wanted their Indians to look a certain way as even as extras, you know, so it's kind of an interesting dynamic when it comes to Hollywood and displaying. I, I don't even know what to say to that, <laughs> but I, I, mean, I have no doubt that it's upholding, again, back to those stereotypes and caricatures and you know, what we think we were taught growing up and what's expected to be seen on the screen. Yeah. Now, well, the last thing I want to talk about is the 1864 Sand Creek Massacre Foundation. And you are a member of that foundation as well as a descendant of the Sand Creek Massacre. I'm hopeful that our listeners have at least heard of this, but I'm not going to assume anything. So if you could share with us a little bit about the 1864 massacre and what the foundation is focused on. Right now. And this connects to our earlier conversation about, I think, our public education. And so both of us live in Colorado, I think. And right now, there is a great exhibit in downtown Denver right now showing the history of that from a native lens. And so if you're in Denver or you're in Colorado, it's worth your time to go to History Colorado and see that exhibit. It's really a, an amazing exhibit. A lot of my family members are in that exhibit. And so, so the history of that is, first Western colonization and the expansion. And there was these ideas around manifest destiny that was happening. And I'm gonna skip over a lot of history just to kind of get to the main thrust of your question. But through a series of treaties and the reduction of land, and there was one peace chief named Black Kettle, and he was such a good human being. He was such a great chief and leader of his people that he had such high level of humanity that if you're elderly or disabled, you would be in his camp. And so he was known to look out for people that might not be, have all the privileges of everybody else. And so he was out there looking out for some of the most vulnerable of our peoples. And so his camp agreed to say, hey, we don't want any more death to happen. 
there's a lot of death happened around Denver and the establishment of Denver, actually. And so they were willing to move out to the nowhere in Colorado. There's nowhere. There's a place out by Eads, Colorado is where it's at. There's just nothing but sagebrush out there and a dry creek bed. It's the Sand Creek. And so they were out there in a volunteer militia here in Denver and some guys that had the high political aspirations. I'm not going to say their names, not even worth saying their names to give them hit that kind of that historical cred. Went down there to go kill Indians to get some political points. But in that camp was my family and my great grandfather. The reason I have that, my last name Spotted Elk comes from Charles Spotted Elk was his English name. Hoish was his Indian Cheyenne name. But he was only two years old. And these stories were told to me, like I've heard these stories since I was a child and they were told to me in such, it's our part of our oral history, actually. If you go to History Colorado, you'll hear our story told in that back room. They have like a little theater that you could hear stories. And my aunt will tell our family story about that. But I grew up hearing that story is that his parents were both killed in that horrific massacre, as well as 200 plus Cheyenne people and Arapaho people that died at Sand Creek that day. But older sibling or an older relative hit him, hit young two-year-old Charles Spotted Elk and hit all day. Of course, he was hungry at the end. They went back to their parents and his dead mother was there and they nursed on his dead mother before they, they walked 20 miles to get together with the other family members. And it's just devastating. He lost everything that day. It's so hard to kind of put that into context. But when I go out there, we go out there as a family every year. But yeah. I don't know, it's just so devastating to think about the inhumanity that happened out there. What the foundation is trying to do, and so I just recently have been put on as an advisory member on the board, but just really trying to be, bring public awareness to it. Just most recently, I'll, so not only to the site, but also I think here in Denver, there's a lot of history here because part of that story is the Calvary, the volunteer Calvary came back to Denver and they created the streets to cheering crowd. You know, Rocky Mountain News covered this. And so basically marched from the ball arena where the Denver Nuggets play. And they went to 16th Street Mall, <laughs> which is a walking mall downtown. And there's people cheering them on, you know, as they had dead Cheyenne body parts on their saddles. And, and so that's the type of inhumanity that was at play. And I think that's important for us to understand. I've heard this and I don't know, I've never been to Berlin, Germany, but I hear you can't walk 100 steps without seeing a reminder of the Holocaust. And it's part of their collective consciousness out there. And I think that spurns public action, that spurns public policy, that spurns law, spurns art. And so I think those things are really important for all of us to understand and know. So it never happens again. It's a devastating thing, actually. That's part of my family history, it's part of my identity. It's hard for me to kind of put more words to that. So the goal of the foundation is it to provide greater public education? Is there scholarship? Talk to me a little bit about some of the current goals. It's mainly public awareness. So to bring consciousness, there is an academic component to it. It's to get scholarly articles out, to get more not only in the academies, but also just in the public. Things like a museum exhibit that's uh, kind of generated. A lot of the people that helped develop that museum exhibit are also on the foundation board. Mm -hmm. so, so doing public education around that. Ultimately to create, and I started talking about how this could impact policy and law and action. Some of the other work that I do and it's worth me bringing up is that Right now, currently in America, there's almost a times three disproportionality of American Indian children in foster care. So you think about it, that's devastating. Times three disproportionality. And so there's a history in America, maybe some of the people on this call don't know, and there's a public awakening kind of happening around this, but there was a boarding school movement that happened here in America. And so and I'm not talking about the fancy boarding schools in the East like Exeter or anything like that. There was forced assimilation and so concerted action and direct action by U.S. Congress. The Indian Civilization Act was passed in 1819. Mm -hmm. And the essence of that was to civilize the savage American Indian, you know, and they aimed at dismantling our families. And so every American Indian I've ever met in my whole entire life, which I've met a lot, <laughs> has connection to the boarding school experience. Mm -hmm. impacted all of us culturally, language-wise. I only know a few words of Cheyenne, you know. I don't speak my language, you know, like 
I've heard it, but I don't really speak it, you know, so it's devastating what it's done to our communities. And so I, I think education is part of that. I think connection is part of creating public change around some of these things. Awareness is part of that. I think oftentimes there's like an uncomfortability with talking about race in our society, obviously. <laughs> But that's a necessary part of the process in order to see our full humanity. And so I'm able to listen to uncomfortable things. These conversations are never easy. They are incredibly uncomfortable sometimes and so worth it every single time. Sheldon, I appreciate you so much coming on and sharing so much about your own personal history, your family's history, bringing our listeners up to speed on some of the things. I have to share with you, the first time I heard you speak was at an event for our kids' school. And one of the last things you said was, and I, I tried to write down the quote and I can't remember it exactly, but it was about tethering yourself to the ground and standing strong for doing what is right. I'm sure I'm screwing that up somehow. <laughs> so it, do you remember that quote exactly? Would you mind sharing it? Yeah, absolutely. It's so all Cheyennes belong to a society. And so one of those societies is the dog soldier society or the dogs, the dogmen, I guess is what they would call them. But part of being a dog soldier, not only did you wear a unique headdress, I actually have one if you wanted to, I could go grab it really quick, <laughs> but they have a unique headdress, but also a marker of somebody that belonged to this society is that they would wear this belt, they have this belt wrapped around them. And so, and it was symbolic, but it was also real that whenever an attack on the community or the attack on your family is occurring, that you in fact would tether yourself to the ground, be willing to fight and stand and die where you stand. You know, you're, you're going to have that type of courage. And I do feel like it's necessary for all of us to be dog soldiers in that sense, in order to have that type of courage, in order to build connections, you know, in order to build sincere allyship, you know, and in order to see our full humanity. And so it takes that type of courage that you're willing to tether yourself to the ground and fight. And so I've always been inspired by that. That's my family society. And I've always been like, oh yeah, that's, I want to be that. I want to have that type of courage, you know, so. Well, I wrote it down and now it will be with me as well. So thank you again, Sheldon Spotted Elf. For those of you that would like more information about Envision Eyes, you can find us at envisionize.com.